Um, and today we have a former uh, Beikai program co-chair for over five years, at least five years, uh, Christian, and um, who invites us to talk about uh, Super Friends, uh, the relationship between product management and user experience design functions. Hopefully it's a topic that's uh, close to many of us. Um, and a little bit about um, Christian. Uh, currently, he's a product and UX leadership consultant at Design and Product, where he also hosts a product and UX community. He was recently appointed by the governor of California. Fletcher. So once again, people should be seeing my main screen. Is that right? Yep. Great. Okay. Well, let's get with it. Um, so it, it's funny. There's a little history. On, uh, if you saw the original um, announcement that went out, we somehow lost the S off of this, and it, it got announced as Super Friend, which... Um, uh, maybe loses some of the spirit of, of the, the two-sided relationship of product management and UX. But there's a strange history to this because when I gave this talk in Zurich, where somehow it was listed as super friends, the power of the product management and user experience, um, and, and somehow maybe translating it into German or Swiss German or something, some of this awesome translation. But we're talking about the relationship between product management and UX. And um, for a quick little... Uh, sort of overview of what I'm hoping to cover in our time. And thanks everybody for coming out on a school night um, to hear about this. Um, first of all, just talking a little bit about why are we talking about products in, in software these days? What does product mean? What's a product, what's product design or what are product designers? Um, how do these concepts relate and how are they supposed to work together? Uh, a little bit of like honest talk about some pain points and frustrations that I'm hearing about that I see in my consulting that I hear when I give talks or here in my community. Um, you know, sharp elbows and stepped on toes in in the in the relationship between UX and product in a lot of uh, a lot of environments, um, and then a little bit of more positive, like, well, what can we do about it? A little, uh, you know, kind of a, a optimistic look at things and talk about empowering ourselves rather than feeling like like victims or like, oh, we got so close to a seat at the table and now there's this product bro and it's sitting in the seat instead. What happened? Um, so. Uh, and and maybe uh, you know um, my reputation doesn't always fully precede me. I mean, you heard my bio, but I, I I come from a UX background. I've had a lot of UX roles at large companies and startups. I've been an IA, an interaction designer, a content strategist, uh, design manager, UX director, product director, and so eventually I shifted over to product titles. But I think I always kind of kept my UX uh, um, chops uh, in the mix. I hope. Um, so we're talking about product a lot these days. It seems like more and more recently, it can be a little bit confusing, um, especially when so many things that they call products online are also very clearly services, Maybe even their services more than products in the old fashioned sense. Um, my sense is that once we had SaaS, you know, once we had software as a service online, the, the line got really blurred. And, and when we talk about products and services, we're often not talking about different things at all. Although we're sometimes talk, still talking about different lenses, you know, where the service journey is often more holistic and cutting across complex um, uh, systems, whereas product thinking is still sometimes very much focused on a specific uh, release or endpoint or something like that. But again, what do we mean by product? When I grew up in the uh, previous millennium, um, if you asked me what a product was, I would have said it's some kind of a thing like this, so something something with that's packaged uh, with a familiar branding on it. You go to the store and it's on the shelf and there's a whole bunch of them in a row. Uh, and the price is sort of consistent and reliable, and the quality is you know sort of expected. Um, and you maybe you grew up with it in the house, and you keep buying it when you're an adult. And that, that's sort of my mental model of a product, uh, you know, kind of pre-internet, I guess. Um, but we're talking about digital products these days, and it's not always clearly defined what we mean by that. Um, so it can be sort of annoying to some folks because it it, it smuggles in some concepts that aren't fully uh, elaborated on or, or clarified or defended. Um, so this is also a product nowadays, right? And, and, and I just took a screenshot from, uh, from Amazon, you know, where there's the opportunity to subscribe to detergent that will be sent to you at some cadence that's close, hopefully to like how often you're going to run out. Um, and, you know, you can see that familiar, uh, Bugs Bunny, you know, like tied, uh, spiral there and, and a version of the logo. Um, it still exists, um, but now we're talking about, you know, Tide Pods, not 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 a box of powder, and we're talking about a subscription. You're signing up to be to be paid to be charged regularly for this, 
um, and it solves a problem for you, which is going to the store and buying it over and over again. Um, so that's also a product. Now that's a product too. And you can see that it shares some, some characteristics with the other products. There's, there's still laundry detergent going on here. Um, but the relationship with the, with the provider and the nature of the product also has to do with this, this uh, you know, scheduled buying in this case, and also buying it online and it's, it's packaged differently and it, it's fulfilled differently. But still a lot of the old DNA of what makes something a product is, is hanging around here. Um, this is a somewhat famous and controversial diagram made popular by Martin Erickson, one of the founders of the Mind the Product conference. And um, anytime I show it, I sort of feel like I have to make some caveats because it can be potentially reductive and misleading. Um, it puts things in circles and equates them that are very vastly different things with lots of, that mean different things to different people. Um, it also asser asserts that the product manager is the role that's in the middle of everything. And, and I like to say that probably every discipline could write a, a Venn diagram that put them in the middle and, and or put us in the middle and put everybody else out in, out in the wings. Um, so I, I sort of say, be cautious about this. But on the other hand, there are, there are, it's not a bad shorthand for the, the, the different um, realms of, of, of making software that product managers touch on. So they certainly need to be familiar with UX and work with UX people. They need to be conversant with technology and work with engineers. And they, and they both represent to a lot of people the business side, but also they need to coordinate with a lot of people in the business outside of the product team uh, and bring those points of view to bear as well. Um, so you can see sort of from their point of view why they feel like they are in the center of, of a storm here of these different points of view. Um, that diagram is so so used and, and, and distributed online that it spawned a thousand memes and variations. And, and as a person who's become a product manager myself, I'm allowed to, to I have license to make fun of us. So um, I don't think it's true that they're really hated by everybody, but the, uh, you can see that's a trend. Now, this is a slide I, I stole from Peter Merholtz, um, well-known UX a uh, pioneer from Adaptive Path who uh, wrote a book on, on org design for design orgs, very good book. And uh, he likes to he likes to rewrite that, that diagram I just showed and said it's mislabeled. That corner that's being called UX is really design. Um, and UX is another name for what happens in the center when you merge design and tech and business. Um, and the design, because the, the, the experience of a digital product is the product itself. And I think he makes a real good point there. And the point is really about share, a shared concern of the people with the UX lens and the people with the product lens. Um, it doesn't necessarily account for the fact that uh, people with UX design titles or UX strategy or research titles and people with product management titles are not doing the exact same job as each other. They're doing different things. Um, the truth gets, you know, the, 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 the convergence between these ideas gets a little bit more true at the organizational level or the leadership level where you can start to say, again, these are lenses, UX and product are lenses on things that involve design and dissolve, uh, involve business and tech, um, but are different ways of packaging up some, some learnings like UX, you know, users, human-centered design primarily, and, and a number of other disciplines that have sort of been merged into UX, like industrial design in general, and uh, information architecture and things like that, um, HCI, of course. Um, and the product side, which, you know, draws more from a sort of a different train of thought. I mean, they, they, they both derive from marketing in some ways, but the, the product school of thought, you know, comes more from a, a business perspective originally, and then sort of this like lean startup version of product that, that we see today. Um, so even though we're talking about the same thing, like what's the experience for the, the end customer, product now has started to become a shorthand for Human centered design, but also agility and account and, and check, you know, having having data and using it to sort of verify whether you're on track and being willing to iterate and, and change your plan as you go uh, and being very outcome focused. Uh, another person has remixed that old popular diagram uh, to try to say, look, you're not there in the middle of all those things. The whole team is working together to make the product. Um, and the product manager is actually mediating between the product that's being built and what customers want. And you can question whether this is a great visualization of that. But I like this idea that people are sort of commenting on the old diagram and trying to sort of uh, make another statement about it. Um, when I was uh, giving a talk over at MasterCard, they shared with me the, their current version of how they talk about um, the guilds that they have. And, um, and what they think those areas are responsible for. And one thing you might notice is that they have moved product out of that center 
product is now more of the synonym for business in their model and responsible for what they call viability and, and what I would sometimes call value. And then what they call consumer experience and design is responsible for desirability in their term and, and engineering is determining feasibility. That all these things are somewhat reductive, but they're helpful models sometimes to get these conversations going. Um, in some ways, I, outside of these Venn diagrams, I prefer this model from Joff Redfern, who's, um, he might be the chief product officer now, but he's certainly at least a senior VP of product at Atlassian. And he used to be a VP of product at LinkedIn. When he was there, he launched the, the mobile version of the LinkedIn app. So he's got some you know, successes under his belt. And at Atlassian, he um, has really championed product craft. You know, there's an internal uh, a global Atlassian product conference internally once a year where they bring all the product people together and train them and have them hang out and, you know, level up and everything like that. So so he's he's uh, put some good thought into this stuff. And so he has this triangle, which if you, at first glance, it's, it may seem like just another version of that Venn diagram. You might say, okay, the general manager type is a boss, it's business, the artist, well, that's the designer and the scientist, I guess that's the engineer. But if we're going to think more about what these concepts mean, you'll realize those aren't those aren't the same. You know, that's like saying cyan is the same as blue or something like that. Um, an artist is not is not a designer, as I think we all know. An artist can make whatever they want. They're they're visionaries. They are expressive. They use intuition. Um, they invent things. They they see the future. They detect patterns and things and stuff like that. Designers, you know, have to meet constraints. You know, they use artistic skills to deliver value. And, and so designers are in here somewhere, but that artist archetype is a different thing. And similarly, a scientist and engineer are famously not the same thing either. Scientists on some level are interested in, in theory. Um, they run experiments, they, they, they use data, they're, they're informed by data, um, and they, they're willing to question their hypotheses. Now, the, a lot of these things are true for engineers as well, but in engineering, you know, um, by, by definition, engineering is practical and, and, and focused on, on delivery. So, you know, which in this case, the general manager is adding that practicality. Um, but what's interesting is, is to say that if a person's interested in product management, um, you could think of yourself as probably coming most strongly from one of those corners, maybe to some extent being a person who's who lives in, on the line between one of those, those two corners, somewhere in between them. Um, but the, the great product manager is sort of in the middle of the triangle somewhere, uh, you know, partaking of all three of those different um, temperaments and modes of, of, of doing. Um, and, but nobody starts out there. We start off in a corner. We start off all, all on one of the sides. If you want to grow as a product manager, then what you need to sometimes acquire is, is experience and aptitude and insight and mentoring, et cetera, in, in, towards the corners where you don't naturally sort of ground yourself so that you can get maybe not to dead center in this triangle, but somewhere into like a smaller triangle um, you know, where you'll still probably start, if you were an artist to begin with, you'll probably always be a little bit on the artist end of the spectrum of these things. Um, but anyway, I think that's an interesting way to think about these, the, uh, what goes into making a good product manager or product person. Um, so we could talk a little bit more about what do product people do? What do we, what do we mean when we say product person? What do I mean when I say that? Um, so I like to think of it, and, and, and this might help, it could help or hurt. I think this, some people like this and some people don't, although it's kind of true right now. Um, and it's a little confusing that there's a concept of product management and there's a concept of product. And sometimes product is just used as a kind of a hip shorthand for product management. I'm a product manager. I do product. I'm a product person. I'm a product guy in my case, but I, used to, I don't like to say guy because it sounds exclusive. I don't think it has to be a guy. Um, but we're also saying it's a product team. There's a head of product. UX rolls up to product. So then you're like, well, wait, is product management one of my peer disciplines? Or is product the overarching thing we all do and product management is just one part of it? And if so, why do they both have the same name? Or is that privileging the product manager in some way semantically? Um, I think that sort of has to be worked out team by team. But for my, I think it's useful for me, from my point of view, it seems useful to think of it as products of paradigm. It, it, it now means making a kind of software that is kind of pa packaged um, and being delivered uh, typically as a service. Um, and it's a frame we didn't used to have when we were just making websites and before mobile apps came along and before a lot of these um, approaches to sort of uh, uh, packaging and selling software online didn't really exist. So the product paradigm wasn't really around or quite as strong 10 or 20 years ago, um, but it's kind of become the dominant way of looking at things. And like I said, it's sort of become a packaging for a bunch of related ideas 
human-centered design you know, or, or obsessive customer focus or something like that, um, as, as well as um, agile iteration and learning and rather than being locked into a six-year program, you know, project management death march with a Gantt chart, um, uh, you know, experimentation, agility, um, and, uh, and focus and, and focus on outcomes rather than on sort of features and things like that. Um, so if you're a product team, yes, in some ways, the product manager is responsible for holding the team's feet to the fire in a lot of those areas. But you can also say that everybody on the team is a product person. You know, the UX researchers and the user researchers are product researchers. The designers are product designers. The developers are product developers. And sure, the, the people doing the operate, you know, sort of orchestration are, are called product managers. I think the term managers problematic in some ways because it's they're not people managers and it again gives this impression of authority sort of in the way the architect if when information architect was a term that came along some technical architects on the engineering side found that kind of offensive that a junior entry-level person could be called an architect when this was a very high-ranking title on the engineering tree so you know there's some semantic hooks issues with with, with these names but the gist of it is that you think of it, we're all working on these things that we call software products now. And so the researcher's not researching, uh, you know, malaria in, 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 in on another continent. And the designer's not designing shoes or rocket ships. And the, the developer is not, you know, making a, a submarine, you know, and, and, the, and the product managers are not sort of running some, you know, some sort of like, like building a detergent box. They're, we're making digital software. And, and, and so we're doing this as, in a shared collaborative way and we all have different specialties um but the strategy is not doesn't belong just to the product manager it should be something the whole team is having a say in and in my and i will say that i'm talking often about how i think this stuff should work and i want to acknowledge that that's not always true it's often not true and just and, and a lot of people might say well that's not been my experience my product manager isn't collaborative or they just told us one day we were a product team and they didn't tell us what that meant or they changed my title from UX designer to product designer without any explanation. And so there's a lot of, you know, vari variance out there. Um, but I think a pragmatic way to think about this and, and, and to make use of it as a concept is to say, okay, product is this lens, it's popular, it speaks to business, and it brings in a lot of these things we care about, like design, like user experience design. Yes, it also brings in this lean agile stuff that's been a challenge for now for a while, but we've got to figure out how to make that work anyway. Um, speaking of which, You've got this lean startup cycle, build, measure, learn. Um, it's it's pretty much become article of faith among most product people, at least as an ideal. Not all teams can actually do it. Um, I think there's critiques of how this actually gets played out. Like there's not always real learning going on. There's just optimizing around data points. Um, or the, even the idea that if you start with build, then you're putting something in the field before you learned anything. You you know, it's a weird time, weird place to start the cycle. But cycles are cycles. In some ways, it kind of doesn't matter where, where you start. And even a lean startup that just quickly built a prototype and, and tested it on some people, the truth is the founder had some idea and, and talked to some folks. And there's some kind of lightweight form of research actually probably did happen. Um, so there is a risk that this very tight cycle of just experimenting, experimenting, and learning, and learning doesn't really have learning in the sense that we think of it if you're trained in user experience design or research. And there's some some tension there. And when do you de-risk complicated stuff and 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 do you know desk research or field research? And when is it okay to throw something out there and let the users you know, vote on it uh, directly? Um, another thing that product people have to do, and and the product manager often has to play a big role in this, is um, you know working with the engineers, getting getting the engineering counterparts on the same page, uh, sort of leveraging their insight and their wisdom and their knowledge of the stack. But also sometimes understanding when they're being risk averse or when they're being overly optimistic, and you know, uh, including them but not overwhelming them with irrelevant detail. It's a whole art to, to collaborating with engineers um, and product people, uh, and, and you know, and they are product engineers, so they're also product people. But the product managers, as I said, are often having to corral folks. If, if you've, you know, if you work in software, if you're if you work on the UX side, the the design side, then you certainly work with engineers too. You don't get anything built unless an engineer builds it for you. Unless you're the jack of all trades, you can do it all. Um, but on some level, I think a lot of designers can, you know, might be a little frustrated when what ships is not exactly what they designed, but they don't feel like it's their fault. You know, they're like, well, the Figma was perfect. It's not my fault that the front end engineer didn't, you know, get it pixel perfect. I tried to do the design QA and they didn't think it was important. So I washed my hands of this. Um, 
On some level, the product manager doesn't get to do that. You know, even though they're not able to fix everything themselves, they sort of have to eat it if it doesn't come out right. So it, it's an interesting relationship, similar to the UX relationship with engineers, but one where you're a little bit more on the hook for what happens. Um, product people also have to coordinate the work of, of, of you know, of multidisciplinary teams and uh, often complex stake, stakeholders, uh, collections of stakeholders. Um, have to make sure that that people are kept in the loop and that there's communication. Have to persuade people who don't report directly to you to go along with the plan or to be you know to cooperative or collaborative, um, and need to sort of learn how to use diplomacy. Product managers again do a lot of that. Often, I think UX designers are people in the mix doing that as well, coordinating across different points of view. Um, and I'd say that they're being product people in that same way when they're shouldering, you know, that burden of bringing together all these different forces towards a unique solution that can that can really address the needs and be successful. Um, so then there's this concept, I think I've touched on it a little bit of product designers, the, the, the job title showed up a while back, maybe it's always been around, but in tech, it was a thing. It's it, it's sort of been, it's meant different things at different times in different companies from what I can tell. Um, for instance, it feels like to me about 10 or 15 years ago, uh, Facebook was hiring people they called product designers. And they kind of meant that to be like a unicorn, a person who could, do some research in the morning and and whip up a prototype in the after you know in the in the, in the around lunchtime and in the afternoon um you know do some uh, pixel perfect design and then like over dinner time maybe like ship the front end code um and there's people out there who can do that but uh that kind of paradigm you know it's great for a tiny little startup or for a company that has its pick um but most of us aren't so great at every single aspect of design um, and I don't think it means that to a lot of folks anymore. Um, sometimes it means a synonym to you for UX design, and it's just like a, a better, you know, the, this is the newer voguish title. We're just calling all our UX designers product designers. Sometimes it means that the, the, the designer does have more responsibility for some of that product strategy or product management or product thinking. Um, I think that regardless of how it's being used, like if, it's, if you, the term's being used in your organization or if you are a designer and you say, well, I, I need to position myself in product, so I need to think of myself as a product designer, then there's a whole bunch of kind of like attributes that UX brings to the table and that the design background sort of has to offer as assets in this larger product paradigm that, that this in some ways coming from outside. Um, you know, starting with the, 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 all the methods of discovery, user, user experience research and, and, and other kind of for, forms of um, discovery. Um, the fact that design inherently is a method of solving problems. It, it, it's like, you know, this, this was, in some ways, the fad of design thinking was to communicate that design itself is a toolkit for uh, that, that leverages creative um, methods to solve problems, to invent solutions to problems, and, and so, so you know UX training brings that to the table. Well, um, using uh, understanding the users and, and synthesizing all the different signals and coming up with a, a persona or a model or, or, or some sort of description of the people that you're trying to build for. Um, also, not just being hung up always in data-driven this and data-driven that, as if data could drive, you know, um, drive the car. I think data can tell you whether you're driving well or not, and whether you're straight, whether you're going to make it on time. Um, but often, you can the data tells you what is going on, um, but there's work to be done to figure out what's causing that to happen. What's the reason? There's a hypothesis, but we have to find out if it's true. And sometimes you can do some tests, and sometimes you have to go out in the field and talk to people or observe them. Um, a lot of UX roles, the strategy, strategy roles, interaction design, IA, um, UX roles, uh, architecture roles involve systems thinking, sort of being able to build a picture of a whole complex system or a complex model, put, put a lot of things into context. Um, similarly, put things into information architectures or figure out, you know, how all the, all the content elements relate to each other and how they're going to be managed. All those kinds of things are helpful. That's, those are all things that, that the product manager needs to get done and sort of needs to understand and do their job well. But unless they come from a UX background themselves, they may not have a full toolkit to model and picture and describe and capture the essential details and elements of, of what of the team is making. Um, so that's something UX can often bring as a gift. Like, hey, we made a map, we made a picture, we made a stack diagram, and everybody can now look at it and go, I agree or I disagree, or let's go to the... Let's go to level three on this chart now or something like that. Um, uh, product and UX people clash sometimes around this, but also can definitely collaborate on prioritizing, you know, methods kind of like the old. Uh, you'll, you'll find product, one, one thing where product managers and UX 
people do overlap is in like the use of stickies and and you know uh the kind of collaborative workshops and stuff like that so there's a there's an ability to to ally on that if if you can um figure out a way to do that um and then you know i, I guess just the the the, the, the it's almost like the basic craft skills of like the ability to help put let's put a picture together visualize something find the right words tell the story um, product managers need to do that all the time they need to influence executives stakeholders they need to update everybody what's going on they have to convince the press of something or get people to buy something and if you can help articulate um you know the story or or the picture or or the diagram that that that, that connects the dots for people um the, all those things are assets uh, that that are needed in the product paradigm but um that ux people bring you know a lot of strength to the table in, in addressing those things um so I think I've mentioned already and kind of touched on the fact that it's not always a very happy relationship right now. Um, people sometimes say, like, do I have to become a product manager to get to get back into strategy? Or why is this person telling me my ideas? There's no time to do research or we can't get that on the roadmap. Um, product people have their own frustrations, too. Um, I talk to both sides. And, and when there's um, miscommunication and unmet assumptions and unspoken um, problems, what you'll find is often both sides are unhappy, but they tell very, very different stories about what's going on. Uh, for instance, I recently um, hosted a conversation for a Mind the Product uh, event in London. I wasn't in London, but it was remote, um, where I had a chance to talk to product managers and ask them about their view of the relationship with UX people. And one of the things we asked them was what were the sort of their stereotypes of UX folks? And some of them were very loving. They're like, I would never do a project without my UX designer or they're great partners. We love them. They're excellent. Um, but other people said uh, they slow us down, um, or uh, they're they're kind of they they're kind of arrogant. You know, they think they're better than us or whatever. And and you might say, well, that's not fair. That's a stereotype. Or I I've never met it. You know, UX people are nice, but it's interesting to hear from the other side that like, oh, it's, we might be coming off. Some of us might be giving a bad impression, just like some of those product managers are giving a bad impression to people over here on the UX side of the fence. Um, so for instance, a lot of people who are not the product manager feel like the product manager has a grip on product direction and roadmap and, and priorities, prioritization, and that things are coming downstream again. Like UX has fought, design has fought to get upstream, to get to the table, to be involved in strategy. And then suddenly it's like, why is a product manager handing me a wireframe and telling me to color it in? How did that happen? Um, uh, you know, requirements similarly are sometimes just handed down rather than figured out together. Um, so, you, so you feel like you're going backwards. Like we went through user stories and jobs to be done and personas or whatever, user journeys, and now suddenly we're getting a list of requirements to design. How did that happen? Um, at the same time, design and research folks are sometimes speaking their your own language, our own language that product people are not fully initiated into. And it can be sort of alienating jargon and you can uh, lose the plot. You know, often when um, uh, user research is being presented to product managers, there's a lot of detail about process, um, often these really, really thick decks. And it, it seems like it's trying to justify everything, but but it's, it's actually overwhelming the product person, the product manager with detail and making it hard for them to pick on the, the critical points. Um, the way that things get prioritized is often like not you know, is done in a way where again it's just handed down or found out and 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 people feel like they're being left out of that um as i mentioned before there's a lot of talk about fully empowered product teams or marty marty kagan's you know idea of of, of an inspired team or or um you know uh, teams that can can sort of be fully independent and in reality we find that's not what's happening often a lot of product teams are performing agile rituals and, 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 you know, having retros and doing all these different activities. And at the same time, still um, acting like a, like a feature factory and cranking stuff out and, and um, you know, taking tickets from the bosses and, and not really being outcome focused or anything like that. So when you hear that, you hear one thing and then you see your own lived reality and they don't match up, that can become very discouraging. Um, deep down, like I said, I think I've already mentioned this, that there's a, there's some assumptions um, that aren't being met. The product managers think design and research have a certain role or purpose. They don't fully understand uh, the history of all of this and the value of it. And they might assign a, a certain purpose to it that isn't the same as what design and research feel like is, is their value and purpose. 
and vice versa. Uh, the product the UX folks are not always fully clear on what the product managers are supposed to be doing, what their goals are, what success looks like to them, what what their dangerous situations are, what they're afraid of, and so. Instead, we have these kinds of assumptions. Oh, that person's a jerk, or they don't get the user, or they don't care, they're just about money or something like that. Um, and it's often more nuanced than that. Um, but because of these unexamined assumptions, because they haven't been brought to the surface because the awkward conversations haven't happened, um, you just keep bumping into each other in the dark and it's very frustrating. Um, and then even, even, uh, you know, even when you have leadership supposedly say you, you all should get along, if the work isn't, hasn't been done to get to alignment, then you just have this constant nagging frustration with working with each other, which is going to come out in the software in some ways. You know, if if, you, if the team is not getting along, it'll show um, in, in the results. So, okay, that's kind of the, you know, that, that are some of the unhappy, that's probably not even an exhaustive list of people could probably suggest other things that are, that they haven't liked at times on, on the way their multidisciplinary teams have worked together. But what this brings me back to is this idea that there is no one recipe for this. There's no simple model everybody can apply. Um, you know, we're unique people. We're in changing times. Technology is evolving. Methods are, are evolving. And the terminology is changing. People bring past experience to their new teams, um, but not always in a conscious way. And teams don't always charter themselves or define this is how we work or this is our method. Uh, sometimes they just sort of carry on with assumptions. And, um, and it can seem frustrating. Like, can we just get down to work? Do we have to spend time talking about how we're going to work all the time? Like, it can feel like living in a group house and having endless house meetings all the time about who left the peanut butter jar out. Um, but the reality is that we do have to spend time um, negotiating how to work together and learning how to work together because it isn't figured out yet. And, and all this friction is costing us something. Um, but if you kind of go through the difficulty and, 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 and face up to it, uh, there's a huge opportunity there. Um, so one thing is, you know, you get these issues about turf, like who's in charge of what, or who's setting the schedule, or at what point are you included? Um, and these are creative problems. These are problems that require creative problem solving, collaborative creative problem solving. Um, everybody avoids them because you don't want to hear, you don't want to be told no, or you're afraid it's going to be a difficult conversation. You kind of know the other person doesn't agree with you or else they would already be including you at the right level. So it's natural to want to put that off or maybe ask your boss to fix it for you or just be frustrated. Um, but at some level, there's always this need to one-on-one -on -one negotiate with your collaborators and go, hey, I'm not sure we all agree on my role and your role. Can we talk about it? And you know, we can say, look, there's things we, we're both involved in, but we have to be clear on who has the final say, who signs off on the design, who signs off on the feature prioritization, things like that. And why don't we just like, actually tell each other what we think it is right now and not be too afraid that maybe we don't agree because we probably don't you know that and i've done things with with, in, with my consulting clients where um, we generate a lot of stickies with tasks on them the team needs to do all these things just first of all just neutrally just adding them to the, the board and then you ask people to sort them out who does it the ux someone on the ux team does this thing someone one of the product managers does this thing um and, you know, generally speaking, you'll get two thirds, three quarters of them will sort out okay. Like most people are, you know, not trying to do the same job all the time. But you get these contentious things in the middle where two hands are on the sticky or two dots on the sticky or whatever. And those are the things, first of all, you, you've made progress right there. If you said, okay, we've isolated the, the problem topics and some are fine. Let's go back to business on who does this and who does that. But user research, we're disagreeing on product discovery versus user research. So let's focus on these tricky ones. Um, but and and let's say, okay, how do we think it works? Let's get a whiteboard out and go. First, you do this, then I do this, and what happens after that? If you can't agree, you just agree that there's some gray areas. Like, okay, we've got some stuck points. We're we're not going to agree in one discussion. These are the tricky ones. We have to figure this out. Um, you know, if you if you feel like the the person you're negotiating with. Um, is just being unreasonable. They're like basically not not willing to give you the basics of what you need to do your job well. That's when you go to your boss and say, "I've tried to work it out, but they, you know, they're not including me in the research, and I can't do UX if I'm not included in the research, or you know, whatever that sticking point is." Um, if I'm a boss and someone on my team says I'm having trouble working with Joe and this other team, my first question is, "Have you tried to work it out?" And if they haven't, I'm going to ask them to try to work it out. If they say, "Yes, I have, but I still can't do it," and I can't coach them through that then I know I need to go talk to Joe's boss and go, 
what's the plan here? Because it's not working at the level of our, our team members. Um, but the main thing is just to come up with some working agreement. Like you're not going to sort it all out in one day, but you can say, okay, we agree on two thirds of it. There's one third of things we're not sure about. Let, let's agree for now on some temporary, some flip a coin on these things or, or you know, divvy them up for now and we'll revisit this in the next sprint. Um, if the other person's very aggressive, let them have all, all of the contentious things, but as long as they agree to revisit it afterward and then be honest, do, do, do the iterative thing of having retros and finding out whether things are working the way they're supposed to. Um, like I said, I've done this with a number of teams. I've never seen the same list of tasks and I've never seen them get sorted exactly the same way. Because again, every team is different and they bring people with different backgrounds and skills, different ideas about what these terms mean. Certain patterns are, are common. I mean, a certain scene, some things never get put over on the UX side and some things never get put over on the product side. The stuff that shows up in the middle though, there's, I've seen a lot of variety. Um, I do think that the there's a huge opportunity around this, like what, what product people, product managers call customer obsession and, and what UX people call user research. But you know, this idea of like deeply, deeply understanding the frustration points and needs of, of, of the uh, of the people you're building your software for um, and, and learning about them. Uh, right now, this is a problem because uh, in a lot of shops, because product managers don't fully understand how user research works or find it to be sometimes too cumbersome and go off and do their own half-baked research that user experience people find you know to be not really valid. Um, and uh, it, it can be difficult getting on the same page, um, but uh, it's worth trying to do that and finding compromise. Like even if your product manager just wants to send out a survey and you know that surveys are problematic or that not the right sort of mode for the kind of research you need to do here, you know, maybe you pick your battles and say, fine, let me help them write better survey questions. Let me add some of my research issues to, to you know, some of my, my uh, research goals to the agenda here and vice versa. If you've got your own research plan going on, maybe invite them to help you set some goals or try to let them ride along or, or let them add some questions to the, to what you're going to be asking um, and things like that. Um, you know, there, there's also, like I said, if you can visualize things, if you, if you can, if you can make pictures or diagrams or show a map of how to get to where you're supposed to go and contribute that to the product manager, then in some ways, rather than asking to be included in the strategy or the conceptual work, you're just immediately demonstrating that you bring something to the table there and that you that it's it's to the benefit of, of the product manager or the product leadership to be including you in this because what they get from that is, you know, a clear map or, or, or a direction or, or an artifact that's useful. Um, as I said, you know, if you've got information architecture background, if you've got that ability to to synthesize complex systems and, and, and to sort of visualize uh, complex sort of contexts, then again, that's an asset that you can bring to the table. As a as a former IA practicing IA, once and for all, you know, always in IA, but but uh, who hasn't had the title in a long time, I, I cherish these kinds of diagrams and I make them for myself when I need them because I I start to lose track of too many dimensions of stuff. But I'm, I'm not as good at it as I used to be. And I'd rather ask my UX designer to make the diagram for me or with me. Uh, and I want to partner on that. Even though now I have the product manager title, I know the value of these kinds of things that help crystallize. And sometimes it's a loose sketch on a whiteboard. Like, hey, are we talking about a, this or that? A, a circle or a, or a triangle? And other times it's something like this that you make it, you know, in Figma or whatever nowadays. And, and so everybody can agree about it or discuss it. Um, I've mentioned already, so I won't belabor the point that... Uh, User experience often, you know, practices, research practices, and, and other sorts of, you know, uh, methods like that um, help bridge the gap between just a purely data-driven approach where you just look at numbers and assume you know what they mean, and then try experiments to move them to one where you you come up with hypotheses about what you think is the issue. Like okay, the data is telling us is actually happening. Let's go out in the field and find out if why we think it's happening jibes. If, if the, you know, did. Did traffic go up because we, you know, everybody loves the new feature or because we're getting closer to a holiday? You know, let's see what other people did. Let's see what the, what the, you know, what, what the other evidence shows out there. Let's see what our customers are telling us. Um, then over time, you can run experiments and, and, and try to test your hypotheses. Um, and user experience folks have not always been deeply involved in this kind of experimentation or often growth oriented or, or data driven approach to trying to tweak and improve things. It can seem alien to a, a, a more user-centered design oriented approach. But I think that to do good experiments, you have to design uh, ideas, you have to design what you're going to test, you have to design 
um, you know, the actual uh, um, interface or variation or concept or or promise that, that you want to see how people respond to. So um, there's a huge role um, for UX in that as well. Um, and I think as I've touched on already, the the there's there's a whole set of traditions of prioritizing of putting up a whiteboard and putting up an axis of like effort versus versus um, impact or or importance versus urgency or other kind of criteria and helping to facilitate a room full of people to agree on what to do next or what's the what's the best idea to try or or what to spend time on. Um, UX people do this, product people do this, you might as well do it together um, and, and leverage those skills. Um, and uh, let's see. So I think the, uh, if, you know, if you're in a position uh, where you're in leadership or you have a say in this kind of thing, maybe if you are the product person, for instance, uh, it's important not to, you know, not to say, well, these people, we don't need the engineers yet, so we'll tell them later what the plan is. Or the design, the design's done, so we don't need to invite the designer to the meetings anymore. I mean, clearly, some people are more heavily involved in some stages than others, um, but these are, we are multidisciplinary disciplinary, um, teams, you know, bringing together a lot of different perspectives and backgrounds to make this complex new kind of software that we make. And generally, you need the brain power of everybody, you know, strategically and all the way through. And sure, the designer is is doing design QA and just being included and tweaking and fixing stuff at the end and not doing as much work when they're, when they're sort of figuring out all the details of the design. And the engineers might be working a lot harder closer to launch than in the early stages when things are being conceptualized. Um, but sort of the pistons, you know, go up and down with the team is, is fully involved the whole time, ideally. Um, if you're a UX person, I think most people who come to Baykai have, have a UX background, but we're in the midst of Silicon Valley and certainly we get product people as well. So we can we can talk to each separately uh, for a moment. Um, I like to say that, you know, think of the UX toolkit that you've developed in your profession as a set of superpowers that you have, that you're used to usually you're shining them on the end user, you know, like deeply understanding that end user, learning their language, figuring out why they don't like the processes they have today, healing those problems, coming up with like new experiences and ser service flows that they can, you know, try that actually work better than what they do today. And and then, you know, and, and talking to them, studying them, fixing things, changing things, learning from their behavior. You know, what if we use that same toolkit on coworkers that we have trouble collaborating with? What if we thought about their language, their needs, their frustration points, why the flow isn't so great for them? We know why it's not great for us. And we can, you know, we, we certainly care about our own feelings and try and make things better for ourselves. I'm not saying we should always, you know, take on the whole burden of fixing every problem. But if you are a UX person and you think about how your customers or your end users, we already challenge ourselves to meet them way more than halfway. I think it's a part of the UX ethos that we don't expect the customer to come to us and learn our lingo and the gap themselves. We, we're trying to meet our customers where they are today. So if you thought of that product manager who somehow the relationship with them is an ideal as, as having a workflow problem with you that you could you could try to solve in the same way you would try to solve someone's problem signing up or, or getting through an experience that you would design. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities there to apply your skills and, and, and your problem solving methods, um, you know, to, to making that relationship work better. Um, and I could flip that script too and say, if you're the product manager and you've got frustrations with your UX counterparts, or you're not quite sure exactly how they're supposed to fit in, or you find something about their attitude annoying, you know, imagine that they're one of your customers, you know, and who isn't buying something. Is it their fault they're not buying what you're selling, you know, and that, and that they're not performing the, what you want, you know, and re being retained as much as you want them to be? Um, instead, you would like try to deeply understand that customer and, and what they need and, and, and what they're looking for and what their job is to be done, you know, and, and why the, the ways they do things today don't work so well for them. And, you know, um, so I think that there, there's a model of taking the same exact toolkit that you use. To, to solve problems for for the the people out there that, that who pay our bills, um, and applying them to the sort of workflow challenges and the relationship challenges in house, um, and it, you know it's it's kind of a it's sort of a relief when you realize oh wait yeah I know how to solve problems like this I've got methods for that um, this is definitely solvable stuff um, and if you take on some of the burden extra burden of trying to be the one to, to make it work um, you know the the you have more agency rather than feeling like, well, this this problem isn't going to be fixed 
until they change or until my boss, you know, steps in and, and knocks some heads together. So um, that's pretty much my point. The, 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 there's, there's no one answer. You know, we all wish that we could just like read one book or one medium post. And it's like, this is the right org chart. These are the right titles. Here's the job roles and here's how you make software. But it's this constantly shifting environment. Um, it's therefore the job of each team to actually work out their own methods and sort of negotiate their own relationships and their own approach. Um, you do have to draw lines and be clear about responsibility, but they shouldn't be like silo lines where people don't cross, but clear lines about who has you know, sort of decision points. Um, you have to have working agreements, like they used to say, I guess that one of this, was it Agile or Scrum that had the idea of rough consensus and running code? You know, you just need a working consensus to, to get through the next sprint and you can always reevaluate your, your working arrangement, um, but you don't have to be fighting all the time. You say, for now, we agree that it's this. And even if, you know, I can commit, disagree and commit to this approach and then raise it again next time. Um, and I think with all those things, there's a huge opportunity. Product and UX sit very close to each other on the table. That's actually potentially two voices in the strategy rooms, in the rooms of leadership, talking about the customer or the user, talking about the fact that, that your product won't be any good if it doesn't meet real people's needs, you know, um, talking about about the, the, the things that we care about, um, uh, you know, the, the things that brought most of us into UX in the first place. So instead of kind of being like siblings in the backseat of a car, kicking each other, could actually be like a united front. Um, so I just wanna uh, kind of as an epilogue say that I, I do host a community called Design and Product um, that uh, is for people interested in this kind of spectrum between UX and product management. and and the relationship and maybe even thinking about being in one role or the other. Um, so if you're interested, you can come to my website and there's a little form, it's just mostly to make sure you're not a bot and I, I'll, I will let anybody in who's interested. Um, you may know that I've got this book out with Rosenfeld Media, Product Management for UX People. Um, and if you don't know, you do know. Um, and you also may not know that there's a conference coming up, a remote conference on December 6th with Rosenfeld, my publisher also called design in product by coincidence, uh, sort of expands on a lot of the themes of my book and also the talk that you heard today. We've got a really great program that we're putting together. Some of the speakers you can see there already. Um, and um, I also teach a track um, at something called Ambition and Power, which is like a continuing education, professional education program for, for mid-career and senior UX people. Um, there's a lot of different, there, there's a number of people teaching different topics there, designing with AI, AI leadership, ethics, a number of different very cool topics. Um, I, I do a product management topic there. Um, one of these days, uh, I started writing this book, Growing Product People, and didn't finish it. There was a pandemic, other stuff happened. I've just been talking to somebody who might co-write it with me and finish it, so that could come out too. And that's about it. Um, we'll share the slides, uh, the link to the slides. I think we can put them in the chat now if we haven't already. And I believe that this, uh, this QR code will also work if you want to just like, you know, aim your phone at this or whatever while we got it up on the screen. Um, but that was what I had for you today. Thank you for listening. Awesome. Yes, we will definitely post the links in the program, but also um, I can paste the link in the chat. Uh, does anybody have any questions or comments or thoughts? More than welcome to unmute yourself and start the conversation. I guess I can start with the first question. Uh, thank you, Christian, for um, this great presentation. My question is um, looking at the whole thing as maybe um, more as a, uh, what can we do as a proactive approach, meaning going all the way back to design education. So what would you suggest, what kind of courses should be included in four-year design curriculum that could prepare a designer i i i don't want to uh, refer it as ux design i want to refer it as design mm -hmm. they would prepare uh, somebody getting out to the workforce with the skills that um, needs to be actually part of their tool set 
Yeah, that's a that's a brutal question because I don't know if I have a happy answer for it. I think um, education struggles to keep up. You know, the 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 methods that education educational institutions typically use to develop curricula and perfect them, um, you know, kind of like often move on the cycle of years and and so that the, often they're playing catch up. I mean, I, I did, for mm -hmm. instance, I, I now I have a, a younger friend who I knew when she was in college and she was taking UX classes uh, at Columbia. Uh, this would be about five or five or six years ago. And of course, there were no UX classes in college when I was in college. There wasn't UX wasn't really a thing yet. There may have been some vague human computer interface well it wasn't called ux it was called i mean you know the definition yeah. of ux is very fuzzy right so there were human factors there were other things that existed precursors mm -hmm. but the idea that you could take a ux class literally uh it was new to me and um you know she interviewed me for like a project she did to learn a little bit about like the history of ux and things like that and by the time she graduated she had decided she'd actually want to be a product manager so she'd sort of already moved through that something that took me 10 or 15 years of my career. She sort of uh, uh, decided to go that direction before even entering the workforce. Um, so, you know, I'm not quite sure. I, I think I'm not an expert on, on, on education at all. And I think that, um, and I've often heard that the education that people get does not prepare them for the workforce. So when they get to the workforce, it's all a big surprise. I, again, I heard this about architecture students when I was in college. Mm -hmm. Uh, hundreds of years ago, you know, that that, uh, that they would learn architecture, but then they get in the real world and they knew nothing about how to make a real building. And, and they'd learn on the on the job, you know, how, how you really do architecture, or what the architect's real role is in the making of most uh, buildings. So um, there might be a, a sense in which you just have to learn the rudiments and then get into the field and catch up with the latest stuff there. And there might also be a need for sort of something like continuous education or the idea that you, you when you start off, you're kind of an apprentice, uh, but but mm -hmm. that you need a curriculum that's ongoing throughout your, um, I think your whole career, but certainly the early stages where you're kind of building your pillars of, of your practice over time. So this is in a way similar to how uh, doctors and medicine are being trained. You know, you you study and then you practice for a couple of years. I guess in the sense, particularly because of that idea that it, there's no way what you study in, in school will be current. You know, it can't. It, it will not. Some of it won't be true anymore. And if you don't read the journals or keep up somehow, you'll fall out of out of step. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Sure. Interesting question. Um. There was one um, question, I believe, from Meg uh, around seeing the slide, and I think that's the slide that you're on. Yeah, I think I tried uh, to see is, that one. Is that the one to see? Yeah. yeah. Is this the one? Uh, actually, is Meg still online? Yeah, I was just hoping we could okay. walk through <laughs> a little bit um, of that slide, and I was very, yeah, when it flashed, I was very interested, and uh -huh. I'd love to hear a little bit more about it. Sure. I mean, I grabbed it literally as just sort of an illustration. So I'm not necessarily uh, the, the deepest expert on the Forrester analysis that this comes from. But I think part of the point is that often metrics, particularly product manager growth, especially kind of growth hacker style product management metrics are often very heavily focused on on user growth, revenue growth, ret retention, you know, monthly active users, daily active users, certain churn, you know, um, th these these aggressive empirical evidence that you are getting users or they are paying or not. And, and those metrics are important. They steer the ship and, and you need them. Um, but that's a hyper focus on like what's happening inside your product live when your product's being used and to some extent the habitual behavior of your customers. Whereas things like customer, some of these customer experience metrics are ways of looking at the, the larger journey, looking at their perceptions or their behaviors outside of your product, how they talk about it to other people, would they recommend it? Um, are they satisfied? Would they be sad if it went away? Um, so I think this is, I you know, I think this is just a useful analysis of some of the other things that you can measure and how they are measuring the experience in a way that's not quite as literal as like say the conversion rate on something you're selling. 
Um, I don't know if that's enough elaboration, but beyond that, I'd probably just be making it up. Thank you. That's helpful. And yeah, it's good to know if I want to learn more, I could go look it up on Forrester perhaps. Yeah. And I think it is good to break out of like often there, I mean, I was talking to someone recently looking for advice and they were, um, they were, they were looking at some very conventional metrics and after a little bit of conversation, they realized, oh, they could look at things like reduced complaints from the call center. They could look at, you know, like, like, like there's other indicators out there of quality or the kind of behaviors you're hoping for that aren't always just like, did people click on the button or not? Um, I, I know. Yeah, go ahead, Janet. Sorry, I, 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 I this is another direct question. I, I, I've been sort of sitting here trying to formulate what is my question? Um, and it, I'm worried it's more of an observation, which is really painful when people do that. But I have you know a long career as well because I'm old. Um, and my career started in product development, actually, in the days when it was called product development and not mm -hmm. innovation. And uh, we did a lot of product development for a lot of sort of CPG, blue, kit, uh, blue chip companies, that sort of thing. And then I moved to a company called Nestle, and I was what was called a, a product manager. Mm -hmm. And then I became a brand manager, which was mm -hmm. different from a product manager. Mm -hmm. And then I became an innovation manager that tapped into both the brand managers and the product managers. And so, but it felt like the roles were siloed, but mm -hmm. interdependent on each other. But there was a sort of clarity about who was responsible for what, and you evolved mm -hmm. through these. And it really helped by the time you know you then you worked alongside designers and the research team and market research and um, you know research and development people in the factories, and and you had this sort of like it was a really eclectic time where you gathered all these sort of associations and skill or skills by association with all these other functions, and. I've been trying to get my head around why it feels so much clearer to me when I think of it in the product space. And then the last 15 years I've been working in the digital space. I'm now in the Bay Area and you know work for a lot of digital companies and why it feels so fuzzy the whole time when it's in the digital space of yeah. who's responsible for what. I don't know if you have a. Uh, and, and actually in the research world, I mean, I come from a market research background, I'm a qualitative researcher now. I do a lot of UX research and market research and marketing research and CX research. Mm -hmm. And I don't have any problem with that because I've always done it all. But then I come across people who are like in their little pod, yeah. and, you know, feel like they can't transfer their skills. So I, it's just an interesting time as to why it's become. Yeah. No, it's a very interesting question. And I think and I'm not an expert on sort of it industrial design and industrial products um but i but i but i think that they're that i think you, you're sort of pointing to on one level a higher level of stability in the practice uh, and 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 in the methods mm. um, maybe a longer stretch of time where uh, essentially like the 20th century where scientific business methods were put in place and maybe there was some more general agreement on what an account manager does or what or what a product manager does or what a what a an innovation manager like, like there there may have been a time for a community of practice in the industry with conferences with with very sort of ways to align on that and certification and training and everything whereas i think things turn a lot faster in internet technology it's sort of more malleable more fungible it changes a lot faster so there's there's a, a lot more reinvention and in some ways as you've noticed with the lingo like uh, everything's all that's old is new again. Like when we have product managers now, but they're not this, it doesn't map one-to-one, -one, right? But it but it does inherit some DNA and the terminology is invoked for a reason. Like the progressives in 1920 were different from the progressive today, but people use <laughs> terms because they're trying to say, we're, we want some of that, or we want to think about it like an industrial process. We want to be more, organi more strict and organized about it. But mm -hmm. there is also another aspect about stability or something, which I have thought about a little bit, which is like my Tide box. You know, if you uh, if you make a product like that, like a Procter & Gamble product in like 1945 through 95 or something like that, or in to today even, you know, you're, every single one coming off the line is pretty much the same with some tolerance. And you've literally kind of You've got a factory that's tooled to make that mm. product. It, it's actually, you know, when that piece breaks, you go to a person who knows how to make that piece for that mm -hmm. line to ship consistent physical product to a certain degree. And that, that's industrial scale product delivery of physical objects. And so that 
that forces a stability where things don't change as fast. I mean, oh, there's a typo on the back of the box. Okay, when we when we print the next ten thousand wrappers, we'll we'll fix that. Or some you know, or something in the formula of the product. Like you need to do R and D and do a a long process to come up with a new version of this thing. Whereas on the internet, you're shipping code continuously all day long, and and people are inventing new protocols and methods and, mm. and little business tricks and things like that all the time. So the titles, the roles, the ways of structuring the work keep getting entangled or hopscotching or, mm. or bringing back ideas in a new term. In some ways, product management is smuggling back in some of the same things that other lenses like design thinking or UX have brought, mm. but mixed with a slightly different recipe. Mm. So and kind of talking in circles at this point, but I think it's a real phenomenon that you notice that it is different. Um, and and maybe that will stabilize over time. I mean, I one thing I do like to point out to folks is that this is still very, very early days of the internet. You know, in normal human sense, this is stuff that none of us fully understand. Mm. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. Sure, yeah, no, great question. It is certainly different when you know, the, the cost of tooling up a factory to make a different size pack or a exactly. you know, enormous investment takes, the tool changes are massive, but also, uh, you know, they used to be dependent on this retail trade, the grocery trade or whoever. Yeah, exactly. You There's never thought to network. your end customers. So you had this sort of double row, whereas, you know, now it's- Now very... it's supply chain and you have marketing you've mm. already planned on. So the, the pace was very different. It had to yeah. be. And they cut, I mean, it led to this, like there was like making it tighter and tighter and less and less tolerance for yeah. failure. But now we're like, it's that on steroids these days. Yeah. yeah. I'd like to uh, say thank you to Christian. I really appreciate the presentation. Uh, I'm also someone who's been in the field for a long time. And just to what you just said, when I started my career as a software engineer, the QA cycle was approximately three years. Yes. And now it's approximately about... <laughs> Three hours. Three hours. Yeah. <laughs> um, if it happens at all. <laughs> yeah. Let, let the users uh, test it. <laughs> that's right. Um, so your comment about understanding users, uh, I still see to this day, uh, teams, particularly in product management, they just want to skip over the user research. And I often try to articulate the risks in business terms, if possible. And I think that sometimes helps them to understand and, and possibly reprioritize or shift. Um, and I also wanted to, I just wanted to ask what people think. I just did a project on user research with transplant surgeons um, in technology that they use in the OR. And I learned that um, without hesitation, if a surgeon is working on a very complex transplant issue, they'll call up a colleague and get advice right there. It doesn't matter that the other colleague works at a hospital in a different country or in a different, they have a freedom and fluidity and flexibility to consult on very, very difficult cases. And as a designer, uh, you know, we don't have that flexibility. And I really think we should. Somebody mentioned earlier about uh, the practice being cl perhaps closer to medicine, <laughs> you know, as a practitioner, like a doctor, you practice medicine every day. And if you have a difficult case, you consult with your... So I'm just wondering if anybody else has had that feeling of frustration. Not being able to call, contact your colleagues and, and having to do everything in sort of a, um, a I, silo. I, I, um, maybe I can pitch in just my view on that uh, to open the conversation. It's, it's, I think that depends on the culture of the organization. Uh, rather than um, how much of a good network one has. Um, I've been in places that that type of conversation was uh, no, no, but I also had extremely fruitful uh, collaboration with other uh, colleagues, designers uh, to solve problems. So I, I think it's a lot to do with the culture a little bit and also how uh, people... Um, are able to leave out their egos. Mm -hmm. uh, that plays a huge role. Uh, and again, it goes to the um, notion of how the organization um, values and the re reward system. If, if it is based on individual effort, then uh, I'm going to be in competition. But if it is 
collective effort and the reward goes to the entire team, that changes the picture. I think there's a lot of um, dynamics and a multifaceted situation from my perspective. Um, related or not, I also want to... Um, it's not uh, individual effort. Uh, I think there's an echo. But if it is collect... Do you guys hear the echo? Not, not now. Okay. Um, what I was going to say is, is actually, Christian, you mentioned uh, the the lingo and uh, and how we articulate certain things. Um, a, a good example is um, there's this uh, whole concept of minimally uh, viable product, right? And everybody's trying to meet that. But if we change that to minimally viable experience, that changes the whole entire approach, right? So uh, those type of things also play a role as um, how we should really look at the whole entire effort, product development and design. So I just wanted to share that. Yeah, I've also heard um, one of my mentors like to talk about a minim minimally valuable um, product as opposed to just being viable. Um, and then lately I've come across something that tries to demystify a little bit by just saying earliest testable. And you could say experience, earliest testable experience. Really, because it's not supposed to be a full product or whatever. It's the, that word product is misleading in there. You're really saying, what's the first thing we can put in front of people in some way and start learning something from, from this? Um, but it gets presented to the bosses as V1, and then you're in this like weird MVP conversation forever. But no, that, that's a good point. And, and I think um, Karen, you're you're that that um I don't know. I'd say my right now I'm doing this work with the government innovation group. I work for the state of California. And what I keep coming around to over and over again, even though we're called di di digital innovation or data and innovation now, um, is that the most innovative thing we can usually do is just communicate better with the stakeholders and have timely meetings, you know, that cut through the back and forth to have stand ups to notice that somebody is th feeling threatened by the thing and needs to be reassured um it, human stuff just understanding people's needs and it's not it's not as glamorous sometimes it's the the, the digital part but it's, it's actually where most of the work happens i think at least at a certain level of coordination absolutely i i had a follow-up question on um the because you've uh worked and experienced the two sides uh, or the multiple sides of you know product management as well as uh, user experience i guess your experience in product management how has it changed and if so <laughs> you know your approach in design and ux i guess I mean, how's it changed me or changed my approach in i mean yeah I, on the one hand I, one story i tell myself is that i've just changed hats i've changed titles but in many ways i've always been doing kind of the same thing um i've been coordinating i've been clarifying i've been communicating i've been diplomatic i've been trying to take leadership you know in the sense of at least do the things that need to be done um and i've done it with all these different titles and that's 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 all true and i and i and i think that that's um benefited me say versus maybe saying uh, my identity is about information architecture or my identity is about being a designer or some other um, professional role or tribal identity or something like that that may have limited my willingness to do a job that didn't have that title or wasn't framed in that way. Um, but I would also say that when I became a product manager and even a product team leader with UX people and product managers reporting to me, I did very consciously take off my UX practitioner hat. You know, I, 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 I'm I still going to claim to be somebody who gets UX, who can talk UX with my team and 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 have a reasonable conversation with them. But the last thing I want to do is be kind of like that meme, like, oh, I'm something of a UX designer myself. You know, like, like here, let me let me do it. I, I can still play. I haven't been a functioning UX designer, like delivering designs to people for 10 years. You know, I've, I've been a, pr a product team lead. I've been a people manager. And, you know, I was in a startup where I was actually doing the UX, so I'm kind of lying. I mean, I was actually doing some UX, but I wasn't doing it as well as anybody I could have hired. You know, I was doing it because because we couldn't afford anybody besides me, and I could do it okay because I've been around long enough. Um, so it's changed in the sense that I think of myself as a person, as a customer of UX and a partner of UX, 
and and even like a boss of UX people, but not a UX person anymore um, directly. Uh, I still want to be a champion of it. I want to, I, I try to practice a form of product management that really gets the point of UX and, and if anything, puts it very close to the center of everything. Um, it's something also that I'm getting to do again at the state where I'm on a service innovation team and I'm a product manager, but I'm sort of being able to model a form of product management that's not so domineering and is more about facilitating the, the, the UX side of things. Gotcha. So um, I think for me, the takeaway was around, you know, even despite kind of being in both worlds, you know, not that they're totally separate, but the egoless and the boundaryless approach to looking at things seems like that common aspect between whether you're a product manager or you're in design. Yeah, and I can speak about myself more than I can try to generalize about everybody. So I, I want to be careful sometimes not to mistake my comfort zone or my temperament for a universal thing. But I would say that the kind of UX person I ever was and the kind of product person I am um, aren't that different. You know, I was sort of always at the product end of the UX spectrum, let's say, or, or, or what turned out to be that. Um, and so it felt, you know, I, I, I spend less time in drawing packages and more time writing stuff and looking at data than I did when I was a designer. Um, but, uh, um, but that's okay. Cause I mean, like for me, the, like for some people being a designer is about, putting the techno on the headphones and and being really in the zone with you know the drawing package or something like that and that's that's a that's a wonderful craft thing but that was never really me so i didn't have to give that up you know to become a product manager or a product a head of product or something and um i guess um one um area that um we had written down earlier was any examples of real life situations, you know, from the folks in the group, I know Janet, you mentioned, um, you know, wearing multiple hats and, you know, seeing multiple sides of even design. Um, I guess, how do you, you know, open up the conversation when you have a conflict with any of your partners, uh, knowing how maybe, or having the experience of, doing that type of role or something similar. Um, and you had a whole, this, um, I think there was one slide around like the trust and um, maybe it was under the pain points, but a uh, turf and how do you kind of negotiate? How do you sort out things? I mean, I'd definitely be interested if, if anybody here had any anecdotes to share um i guess the... one could apply the same techniques as they are apply applying with their spouses they would be a good starting point <laughs> <laughs> i was going to say something very similar it's like trying to understand what the common goals are and like ensure that you are actually working to that same objective so if it's a marriage it's like we want to be happy and support each other and enjoy things together and apart whatever it is and I think I honestly think business relationships shouldn't be so different or team stakeholder you know in the end if there is somebody who's really fighting against something is it because they haven't fully embraced and understood the overall objective that you're all working to there shouldn't really be conflict just maybe not understanding the clarity of each other's skills you're bringing to the table or the work that needs to be done or the who should take the lead on something. And it's usually a misunderstanding um, yeah, that it stems so. from. So, but it's an interesting question. Yeah, that's why I encourage people to have the uncomfortable conversations. It's normal to want to avoid them. I don't want to have those conversations. I don't want to go into a room where I think someone's going to say no to me or they don't agree with me or they don't respect me the way, I, you know, like it's true. They don't, you know, that's a problem, but I need to know that if that's true. And so the thing is kind of gritting your teeth and, and, and kind of being brave about it. And, and, and one startup I worked with, for, I worked at for a while, seven cups, we had a saying, the problem is the path. Uh, meaning that like, if you look the problem square in the eye, if you look at the real problem, the solution is in the problem. You know, it, it, the, you find the solution by going deeply into the problem. And it's sort of like, oh, here's the splinter. Here it is. And you take the splinter out. But but if you avoid the problem, the splinter just festers there. You know, you, you're just hoping it goes away on its own. 
I love that splinter analogy. That's so great. Like you got to find it. What is it causing the pain? Yeah. And it's more, and, it, and also be passionate with yourself that for not having done it yet. Like we all walk around with splinters that we hope will work their way out on their own, you know, but there's that point where we have to go, this thing is not fixing itself. I need to, I need to get the tweezers out. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and often it's nothing to do with that splinter. It's the splinter next door to it. You can't, you know, they're yeah. in pain because other people aren't listening to them in their life or something. I mean, it's, no, really, it's also true. Complex. It's, it's also true that often you can't solve the problem on the one-on-one -on -one level because it is systemic. And, and sometimes it's like my organization is not set up to do this well. They're not teaching craft. They're not setting boundaries. They're not. And that's a tough thing to discover, too, because then you're like, do I try to fix this place or am I hoping, um, you know, to go somewhere, you know, that, that it's going to, um, you know, th that I have to leave. Basically, like, there's no way this place will ever get better. Um, mm -hmm you escalate, you try to make things work, but sometimes you have to be realistic and go, I can't do my best work on this team because they don't value or they don't, we can't, we can't come to a working agreement that, that that's good enough for me. But I think that's, that's a last resort. And a lot of people aren't even trying, you know, to work it out yet. Yeah. Um, I will actually play time cop <laughs> and point out that it's nine o'clock oh, yeah. and I want to be mindful of everyone's time. And Christian, of course, thank you so much for taking the time. Any closing thoughts before we end our session today? I think we've heard me enough, certainly. Uh, <laughs> I, see, I see Gail just hopped on an old old friend from Big High and Yahoo. So it's nice to see another friendly face out there. Great. Well, Thank you, everybody, for the discussion. We'll post some of these materials online and hope to see you next month. Thanks, Meta. Thanks, Christian. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you all. Bye.